and I'm going to turn it over to, uh, I believe we have Clarissa tonight, as well as Peyton doing the introductions. So Clarissa, can you get us started? Yeah, so I'm introducing Dan. Um, Dan grew up on his parents' 60 cow Holstein herd in Eastern Ontario called Brady View Farms, where his passion for cows and pedigrees all started. And now Dan is the co-owner and manager of Blondin Sires, along with the marketing manager for our firm Blondin. Uh, having been there for over eight years now, Dan is responsible at Blondin for the genetics program, sourcing and purchasing the sires, international human sales and marketing. Um, before he worked there, um, uh, he worked for CMEX as their international embryo sales manager and product support specialist, allowing him to travel to over 24 countries around the world. Excellent. Welcome, Dan. And over to Peyton to introduce Seth. I would like to introduce Hi. Seth Carpenter. Seth, along with his wife, breed whole season jerseys under Carps View, under the Carps View prefix. A highlight came last year when they won junior champion of the World Dairy Expo and the Holstein Show and overall Supreme Junior Champion. Seth works full-time for ST Genetics as the New England Territory Manager, providing reproductive and genetic solutions for dairymen and women to help drive progress and profitability for their business. Thank you, Seth, for taking the time for talking to us tonight. Excellent. Thanks, Clarissa and Peyton. So as I said earlier, it is a panel tonight. So we're going to start off with Dan and uh, then followed by Dan, we'll have Seth and then we'll open it up for all our general questions. So Dan, over to you. Thanks, Jen. Should uh, I'm just going to put it on uh, my screen share. That's OK. It sure is. Go ahead. OK. Um, it just says host disabled. Oh, hang on one second. I can no fix problem. that. Yeah, you should be good now. Okay. Um, yeah, perfect. Okay. There we go. Oh, one second. There we go. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for having me, everyone. Um, as Clarissa mentioned, my name's Dan Brady. I am one of the owners at Blondin Sires, and um, I started there about eight years ago at Blondin, um, working on their embryo program and their genetics program. And then uh, about uh, well four years ago last uh, four years ago last week we started Blondin Sires, our own um, our own AI company. So we've used genomics uh, quite a bit since it's first started. And uh, tonight I'll just go through and share with you a little bit of how we do it. What we use, um, what we use, how we use it, and some of the results that we've seen from it. So, uh, I'll just get started uh, a little bit further to what Clarissa was saying. Um, I am the genetics and marketing manager at, at Blond and Sire. So, part of that includes finding the bulls uh, to take into our program, and then part of that is a lot of it is doing genetic research. So, trying to find cows and pedigrees that that we like, um, the ones that carry the genes that we like, and um, trying to get sons or daughters from them into our program. So a uh, big part of my day, a huge part of my day is actually just sitting and studying genomics. So the results, and I'll show you some of those tonight. I'll show you some, what they look like when they come out and, uh, and how we use them and how we make uh, decisions based on them. Um, I also, part of my job, a big part of my job is the marketing and branding. We do a lot of uh, social media marketing, so you'll see lots of pictures and videos and things like that of, of the cattle we work with, the bulls and their daughters. And I spend uh, quite a bit of time on that, uh, specifically in Facebook. Uh, we do a huge amount of marketing through Facebook. So. This is, um, this is the farm. This is Fair and Blondin. We built this barn uh, a couple of years ago now. And actually this year, we're also putting an extension on the barn. So even though the barn is only a few years old, we've already outgrown it and we're starting, uh, starting to work on an extension for that barn. So, um, but we went from a 100 cow tie stall into this um, uh, much larger open free stall herd. So we've had to, uh, We've had to learn and adapt to the new environment 
and uh, the cows love it. They went up in production quite a bit, and they also up in embryo production when we went in there. So um, I won't talk too much about farm, but anyone, um, if you have any questions throughout the whole presentation, just just stop me or uh, interrupt, and I'll. I just have to put on Jennifer. I have to put on the chat. Here it is. Okay. I found the chat. So if you have a question too, just drop it in the chat and I can watch for it. Um, but a lot of you mentioned things um, in your opening statements about different traits and a lot of them are very similar to the ones that we use. So I'll show you tonight a little bit of how we use them and what we look for. So this gal, some of you may know her. Her name is uh, London Avalanche Darlene. She was first milking yearling at the Royal in the red show and second milking yearling at the Royal in the black and white show. So it's something that's, something that's uh, pretty rare for a red cow to do uh, that well in the black and whites as well. But the bigger part, the reason why her picture is here is because she is a result of using genomics uh, in a mating to make the next generation. So when we, um, we went to breed her dam, uh, we looked at all of her genomic information to help us make a better breeding decision to, to finally get to this animal in the end. So I'm gonna show you tonight uh, what we do, what we go through and what we look for and uh, where you can find that information. But uh, Darlene, Darlene's a favorite of mine as well. It's a personal favorite, but um, she is the result of using genomics. And some, some people are a little scared of using genomics, but actually it's really, it's really not that complicated. And I'll go through it here tonight and kind of simplify it so that everyone can use it in their program. So, so to start, what are genomics? And genomics are simply the genes that an animal carries. So that could be um, your hair color or the cow's hair color, or it can be traits such as calving ease or uh, somatic cell or uh, daughter fertility. Daughter fertility is a trait that I watch a lot. Um, these are just genes. They're all the genes that every animal carries. And what we're talking about tonight is specific to dairy cows, but it's not, it's, not specific to just any breed. It can be specific. Um, it can be different. All animals carry genes, and those genes let us know how that animal potentially will produce in the next generation. So it's very simple. It's just the genes that we give those animals. Now, the genes had to come from somewhere. So when we're looking at the genomics, it's simply which genes they got from their parents. So we'll look at the genetics of uh, an animal and we'll see, okay, maybe she needs a little bit more milk. Well, we can probably see by looking at her parents where she got the traits for that milk. Did she get the milk more from her, from her mother or did she get more milk from her father? Those are the genes that she carries but she inherited them from her parents. So gen genomics let us see which genes have been passed on to the next generation. So why do we test them? Um, the big part of why we test them is it just gives us another to make a better decision in a meeting program. So with genomics, you can't see, you can't look at an animal and see if she's going to be good or bad for daughter fertility, just by visually looking at an animal, you can't tell. But if we genomic test them, we can. We can see if they carry the genes that allow them to be better at getting bred back, better at calving ease, more production, um, things like that. We can see the difference between full sisters and we can make them differently than we would if we didn't have that information. So basically, we do them to give us more, more information and a more educated breeding decision when we're breeding those animals. Another thing that it does is it allows us to find uh, genetic diseases or haplotypes. Uh, there's two, they're two separate things, but we look for um, 
things such as HCD, which is a disease that affects baby calves. Um, and we can look for things like haplotypes that cause abortions in cows. So a lot of those diseases, they only show up if you match two matings together, if you match two carriers together. Um, just like red, red only shows up when you put two red genes together. And a lot of these diseases are very similar. So with that, um, we can see which of these animals then carry those traits and then make sure that when we're breeding them, we don't cross those traits. Um, uh, we don't cross those traits so that they, they show up again. So, um, uh, Maddie, uh, uh, Maddie just asked a question here. Um, what's the difference between genomics and genetics? So uh, that's a good question. Very similar. Genetics, actually, I would almost argue they're the same. Um, genetics, uh, genomics are the genetics of the animal. So what genes, gene, genetics and genomics all center around the word genes. So genes are on the DNA of an animal, which individual genes they carry. So this is a good question, Maddie. Um, so genomics and genetics are basically the same thing. Hey, Seth, I see you just logged in here, so. Um, so, uh, sorry, um, back to the topic. Uh, the one thing I mentioned is genomics allow us to see uh, traits that we normally wouldn't see. So when we're looking at a heifer um, and trying to pick a bull what to breed her for, it allows us to see things like health and production traits. So um, for example, we had uh, three full sisters that we genomic tested one was a hundred plus 100 for milk one was plus 500 for milk and the other was plus 1400 for milk so we could breed each of those heifers differently just based on knowing that one is going to be a better producer most likely and one is going to need some more milk in the next generation so it lets us see those things before we can actually see them with our eyes. So it's, it's a great advantage. It's just another tool that we can use to make a better breeding decision. So how do we get the genomics? Uh, I stole this photo from Holstein Canada. Uh, there is two different ways we can do it. Um, on the left, um, or sorry, I think it's on your left. Uh, the photo with the hair, the, the hand pulling out the hair. So we can pull hair follicles and then we can test those follicles for their DNA, which shows us their, in the end, their genomics, what genomics they carry. And then on the other side is a little gadget um, that takes a small tissue sample from the ear of the, of the heifer or bull and it gets put into that little test tube up at the front and um, we ship that test tube in uh, and, and then they're able to test it. We uh, use this version, the test version. It's, it's very easy to use and um, uh, very fast and very accurate. So we use that in our sampling. So those are the two ways. You can either pull the hair off their tail and it has to get the follicles at the end of the tail, at the base of the tail, I should say, or we use the, on the other side, the ear, ear sample, which takes a very small sample of tissue from, from the calf's ear. The best part about it is we can do it as soon as the calf is born. We can test those animals, already start to make decisions about what we're gonna do with them in the future. So, so um, I wanted to show you quickly what, what, the, uh, what the results look like. So, I'm going to show, I think Seth's going to take a look more at the U.S. system, and tonight I'm going to look more at the Canadian system and what our results look like when we get them here in Canada. So um, here is a page on an animal. It's just an, a random animal from the farm at, at our place, but we get all of our results through a system called uh, CDN, which has now been changed to, to be called Lactinet. But most of us in the industry, we just refer to it as CDN. So all of the numbers you can see on this screen are the results of the genomics. So this animal 
has been genomic tested. And uh, let me can here. I'll just write, be able to write on the screen a little bit. But um, so how do we know this animal has been genomic tested? We can see it. There's actually only a couple of ways to do it now. Sorry, I'm just looking for my mouse. Just give me one second. Oh, maybe it's not gonna let me. Sorry, I was just, go. is it gonna let me draw? Oh, undo that. Anyway, there is a, if you'll see under, right this word production on the left side, there's a GPA and that G is just the, is what you're looking for. It means that she's genomically tested. So these results are showing the genomics for that animal. Um, after that, then we're gonna, I'll go in and explain um, what we're looking at, show you some of the numbers. It's, it's, there is a lot of numbers, but we kind of narrow it down to only a few traits that we're gonna try and improve on the next generation. So, oh, sorry. One second, it's not letting me go to my next slide. Just bear with me here one second, guys. I don't know why it's not letting me. There we go. Okay. Yeah, okay, so um, some questions here that came in. Um, is there a website that we can go to to learn what all the genomic numbers mean? So, um, CDN is probably one of the best websites. Uh, however, each of the individual traits at some point are self-explanatory, but sometimes it'll be useful for someone to walk you through them. So I'll do some of that here tonight, um, just depending on time, but I'll go through and show you each some of the traits and ones that we're looking for. Um, someone asked uh, the R, what does that mean on the screens? So that's percentage reliability. So that is, how accurate that trait is. So some traits, we're actually able to predict them better than other traits. And we want that reliability number to be as high, excuse me, as high as possible. Um, oh, wait, the percentage R is also, the percentage R at the top right of the screen, that's the re, uh, relatability. So it's how it's like inbreeding, but it's how related they are to the population at large. So it's not one I really look at too much. I look at the inbreeding number a little bit more. So, um, so I'll keep going. Um, oh, can you see it, Jen? Now you can see now. Yeah. yeah if you put, if you point your cursor can, down, we can, can see it is. Oh, perfect. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it was supposed to let me draw, but it doesn't want to let me draw. So anyway, so that is right here, the relationship value. That's how that animal is related to the general population in Canada. Uh, Seth will talk about some stuff in the US, but this site is all the Canadian based information. So, so I will, uh, someone was asking, uh, Julia, you were asking about what's good and what's bad. I'm gonna go through, uh, actually I'm gonna use this animal and a couple other animals and show you how you can see which traits are good and, and bad. So. so to begin with, it's just like a regular proof. So if any of you are familiar with looking at proof sheets on bulls, it's exactly the same. You're gonna get the results. The animal I just showed you is a heifer but if we look up a bull, it looks exactly the same as this. So we're gonna use the results just like any other proof on a bull. There's nothing special, there's nothing different. It's exactly like looking up the bulls that you wanna use in your program, exactly the same way you're looking up, except we're gonna look at it on the female side. So as, it, as I was mentioning, it shows the positive and negatives of a trait. So it'll let us look at, um, you'll see the one, you saw there was one trait that was really far to the left. So we're gonna look at that trait coming up, it's leg set, and it lets us see both, uh, it lets us see what genes that animal carries for that trait. 
So I'm going to go through and I'll show you a couple of those. So how do we use them? This is how we use it at Blondin. We're making reading decisions. We always like three traits. So only three traits and that's it. If you try to improve more than three traits in one generation, you end up with such a small chance that you'll actually improve all of them that you won't get what you're looking for. So for us, we, we take a look at the animal visually, and then we also take a look at their genomic results, and then we make a decision based on that. We pick out no more than three traits we want to improve going to the next generation. Keep it simple. Breeding is not actually that hard. It is hard, it takes time, but picking the bulls, just try and keep it simple. If you start to overthink it, then it gets too complicated. So keep it simple, keep it to three traits that you want to improve, and that'll help you breed into the next generation. So I'm going to take a look at that heifer named Amanda. Um, here, here's her name right here, Blondin, Dateline, Amanda. So if I look at this heifer right now with her genomic results, I'm going to see, okay, so she's really good for milk. Um, anything here like over 500 is, is pretty good. And she's all the way up at 19, almost 2,000 for milk. So we bred this heifer for that. Her, her sire is a bull that was very high for production. So it looks like she got those genes from, uh, from her father. Her mother is pretty good for milk too, but her father was really good for milk. So we can see that the genes for, she got those genes for milk, exactly what we were looking for. Uh, however, she did get some traits that we weren't looking for as much. Um, Matt, uh, Maddie asks if these are like EDs. So EPDs is, I think Maddie, you're probably talking about um, beef, beef animals. Beef animals use what are called EPDs, estimated breeding values, um, or I'm not sure actually what it stands for in, in uh, beef terms, but ED, EPDs is usually a beef term and it's exactly the same thing. Yeah, so you, these are the expression of those genes. So. If we look here, uh, like I said, she's really great for production, but she's going to need some help in some of her type traits. And specifically, uh, we can see this one is a negative and it's a median suspensory. So if you all know the back of the rear, on the rear udder of a cow, the line in the middle that divides the rear udder, that's a median suspensory. So this cow, this heifer, she's only born in May last year, is minus one for median suspensory. So right away for me, that's a red flag that we need to improve that on the next generation. So we're gonna watch that. So we take a note, okay, we're gonna watch that. Then this is the big one for me. Right away, we can see she is um, 11 S and the S stands for straight. A cow is either an S or a C curved or straight. And you can see it here on the sides. So we want to make sure that this animal is very likely going to be very straight in her leg. And if an animal is very straight in her leg, she puts pressure down through her foot and down into the back of her hoof. And an animal that's very straight isn't going to last as long in our, in our environments, in the freestall or uh, walking in pasture, or even in the tie stall, standing, standing in the tie stall. She's gonna get very sore on the bottom of her feet and up through her hock. So this is a major trait for this heifer. We're gonna to have to uh, try and find a bull that corrects that uh, to use on her. So that's for sure. Um, a couple other questions. Uh, what? What does the ET mean? Okay, what does the ET mean at the end of the sire's name? So that's right here. So ET, it's very simple. It just means embryo transfer. So that bull was produced using embryo transfer. Very simple, um, nothing more than that. Um, we don't use that in Canada. The US uses it. So most likely when you see that, it's coming from a US animal. 
Um, in Canada, I know that this heifer is an ET heifer because here it's right here. But in the US, they put it on the start of their name where we put it under their name. So, and then I had one more. Sorry, one second. Not. Doesn't want to move ahead, Jen. Just the the down arrows on your on your computer might work, or on your keyboard. Yeah, that's what I'm using. It's hmm. like it's frozen. It's not frozen because I can see everything. Um, I had just typed in there, Dan. Um, EPD uh, stands for expected progeny difference in beef cattle. So ah, it's, a, it's a term that they use in the beef world. My wife is a beef breeder, so um, I have discussed it very often with her, with my father-in-law. But I never actually, um, I never actually looked it up what it stood for. Why is it not slide here? Uh, trying to figure out what's going on here. Jim, it's not letting me move at all. Maybe Dan, as you're just playing around with that, there's a, there are a couple yeah. other questions. Um, how much does a genomic test cost was one of them? Uh, Seth, you can probably answer that better than I can. Okay, here we go. Now it's catching up, okay. Sorry, Jen, we have to, uh, looks like we have to share it again. No worries, you should be okay to go ahead and share. Cool. I'm not sure on pricing in Canada. Oh yeah, um, yeah, you're it, just uh, There we go. Are we back, Jen? Yeah, you are. Perfect. Yeah, Seth. Um, yeah, you're right. You're in uh, American dollars. Um, I think in Canada for a female, it's $35, I think. I'm not exactly sure. That would be something I'd have to look up, but I, I think it's around $30 or $35. And then to do bulls, so it is more expensive. Yeah, it's, it's, you're yeah, right. So that's the it same in that. the U.S. Okay. Um, and it varies for us a little bit. Um, we have our CDCB, which is the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding, and they assess fees uh, for genomic testing to the breeders, and that's based on how much information they share back into the total system. So it varies a little bit from yeah. farm to farm, but um, you're generally looking in that $35 to $40 range for, for a female. So uh, finishing up with this heifer, we're looking at here. Um, you can see she's she's to the left on all of her uh, uh, rump traits, and that's something we watch a lot in our program is rump angle. So we would specifically be watching and looking for a bull that's going to correct that rump angle on this heifer and the loin strength. We'd want to pick a bull that's pretty nice overall for for rump. So just opening the chat back up, it closed down. There we go. Okay. The only other question, Dan, in the chat was one about how accurate um, are genomics. Oh, okay. That's the, <laughs> that's the most famous question of all. Um, each trait is a little bit different. Some things are more accurate than others. Um, it depends how much information is also in the pedigree. So you'll see uh, reliability here, and that's what I was talking about before, 74%. So when a bull gets proven, a proven bull, so that means they have progeny daughters milking and classified, you'll get daughter proven bulls at 90 to 99%, um, depending on how many daughters they have that are classified and milk recorded. So that's why it's important to classify and milk record because it puts back into the system more reliability. So 
the high, so this number means 74%, it's about 74% accurate. So there is still going to be some variation in these numbers compared to when, um, when the cow is milking and those type of things. But so far, we're finding it very accurate. It's, uh, like I said, um, that cow Darlene was bred specifically using genomics, along with, of course, our visual uh, watching the animal themselves. But so far, genomics has been very, very accurate. And it's something that continues to get better the more research and the more animals that are done. So. Um, so going ahead, so this is another animal um, that I picked out and we're gonna take a look at her quickly and see what I would pick out if she was, well, she is our animal, um, what we wanna correct and just using genomics. So remember, this is just the genomic side, but we also want to look at the ant to see what they like, uh, because environment also plays after in the animals and what they look like. So we want to check them to make sure that their genomics match up with that animal and how we want to go ahead and correct them. So we watch a lot in our system for type, or in, in, in Canadian system, it's called confirmation. Seth might mention it a little later. He'll call it type in the US, but in Canada, we call it confirmation. So this animal is 16 for confirmation, which is extremely, extremely high. Anything over 15 is considered very, very high. So, um, but this animal, um, you can see she's fairly low for pr protein percentage. So we get paid on our milk system on components. So this animal, we're gonna need to pick a bull to use on her that's really good for protein percent. Then the one thing that I really like about genomics is it does traits that we can't see looking at the animal. And this one specifically is daughter fertility. So that's how easy an animal gets pregnant when you breed them. Um, we want them to be pregnant as soon as we breed them the first time. We don't want to take three, four times to breed an animal to get them pregnant because it costs money every time. So we want them to be pregnant in the first service. And this animal we can see is fair, fairly poor for daughter fertility. So right away, when we go to breed this animal, we're going to try and find a bull that is very good for daughter fertility in hopes that the genes from the bull we use will be mated against her. So that's why we're gonna watch for that specifically. Um, that's something that relates, uh, Seth might mention it, to DPR, which is a trait in the U US, but it's very similar to that trait in our Canadian system. So we watch uh, daughter fertility quite a bit, and we always want to improve on that in the next generation. This animal is clearly below average, so we really want to watch that in the next mating. And then finally, we have teat length. Teat length is one thing that more and more people are watching. This animal looks like a 5S, so she's a little short, so we're probably going to watch that in our mating as well. So. Dan, just a question here for you. What does daughter fertility mean? Yep, so daughter fertility, Ashley, that means that how easy that cow or heifer gets pregnant. So it's how easy they, um, once, they once they're bred, if they catch, if they're pregnant after the first service, that means they were very fertile. So it's how quickly and easily that animal gets pregnant on the next, on the, on the service. Good. So we looked at those animals, we saw what we want to improve, and now we look at the three, we look at those three traits that we want to improve, and <clears throat> we match them up with a bull who improves those three traits. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can see it'll be very hard for us to match up if you had five traits to try and find a bull to fix five different traits. So a lot of times we're only picking two or three traits 
to try and improve that next generation. And I know some people, some people already have a feeling about genomics that they don't, they may not use it or they don't think it'll help in their situation, but genomics allows you to see things that you can't see with your eyes. And when we see them, we can imp when we see them on paper, it means we can improve them on the future. So we look at those three traits that we want to improve and then we find bulls to match to it. And then of course, we want to improve each generation. So as we go from one generation to the next, we sometimes we'll use a bull on an animal just to improve that next generation. So then that way in two generations, we have, for example, um, that, ha that heifer that was really straight in the legs, we can improve on her and make sure that those legs are improved in two generations. Uh, Jordan asks, what are three common traits you put together? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, Jordan. Um, do you mean like <clears throat> three traits that breed together fairly regular or? Um, I think, I think Dan, I think what she's asking and Jordan, you can correct me in the chat if you want, but I think what she's asking is what are, are there, are there three traits that you typically um, on average are trying when you, when you're evaluating your, these genomics that typically you end up looking at more so than other three, than, than others. Are there three that yeah. come to the top of the list on average? Yeah, for us, yes. Um, there's some traits that we watch a lot. So rump angle, that's a big one. I watch that a lot because rump can be affected by environment. Um, if their hooves are trimmed, if they're well taken care of. So we watch rump angle a lot because we want to improve on that. We like level to low rumped animals, not too low rumped, but level to low. Um, I really don't like high pinned animals. And then um, daughter fertility is the other one. We watch that a lot. So you, you can't see that without um, actually doing genomic testing. And then <clears throat> the other ones, We'll watch things like um, production. Those three, actually that one heifer where we picked out those three are, are three that we watch a lot of. So in the end, um, to wrap it up, these are, breeding cows is fun. And we want you to have fun when you're looking at picking um, different traits and different things to improve. And genomics just adds to it. It gives you more information so that you can make a better, better informed breeding decision about those animals. If, you, if you're just looking at an animal, there's lots of things that you actually can't see. So using genomics, it just helps us to make a much better breeding, much better educated breeding decisions. So, so that's wrap for mine. Um, and you want me to take questions or we will get set going or? Yeah, why don't we, we, there's a question here for you, Dan. How accurate is daughter fertility? Um, actually, I have to look at that. Seth, do you know the accuracy on uh, daughter fertility? For me, daughter fertility is very accurate. So I can, we, <clears throat> by accuracy, I also, I also take into account how easy it is to pass on or the heritability of a trait. Daughter fertility is one that we can see being transferred from generation to generation and that we can see improving from generation to generation. So I, I, I use it considerably. I watch it a lot and it's something that we, we feel that it it, it transmits strongly. Um, I don't. I don't know the heritability off the top of my head, but it is something that we watch. We watch quite a bit. So, who's my favorite sire? <laughs> do you want me to get into that, Jen, or do you want? So, Dan, if it's okay with you, this question comes up a lot for us. So, if it's okay yeah, with you, we'll hold the, that one till the end. Yeah, yeah and no maybe problem. We'll let you, you and Seth both finish on those questions. Sure. No. No problem. Yeah. 
So the, another question here about the bulls you're currently using. So we'll hold that till the end and let you talk about. Um, yeah, no problem. Let's talk about the bulls. We got yeah. a question other... in our we got a question at our house here. Quick, Jenny, if that's okay before Seth starts, because I, I want to ask Seth this question too. But Dan, um, and I don't know, I don't want to put you in the hot seat. This, um, okay. but you personally, or what is your feeling? Do you feel genomics is contributing to um, an increase in inbreeding in the breed, or or is it maybe helping to decrease that? What's your thoughts on inbreeding in genomics? Um, that's, it's a good question. Um, it has, so when, a geno when genomics first started, we thought it, inbreeding would actually spread out because we would find new genes and uh, new families and things like that. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened as much as we had hoped. So although inbreeding we can use genomics to watch the inbreeding, and that's something we do a lot actually. So every mating that we do at Blondin, we put the mating into CDN's inbreeding calculator, and that way we know um, we know how inbred that combination will be. So it's something we watch a lot. It genomics has unfortunately uh instead of widening the base it has narrowed the base so <clears throat> as soon as a bull is very high for glpi or gtpi <clears throat> then all the top breeders who are producing bulls for ai they end up using that bull and quickly it becomes part of the population so then it's it's a uh, more lot more inbred but the good part about it is with inbreeding you just need to use one generation of a different bull to spread that back out. So if you use an, uh, in, an inbreeding calculator to do your mating and you use a bull, which we consider an outcross sire, as soon as you put a bull that's not related to that animal, then it, 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 knocks, it knocks out the, the inbreeding. So to answer your question, we use it a lot. We watch inbreeding quite a bit. Um, it has, genomics has contributed to a higher amount of inbreeding in the breed as a whole, but we can use it also to go the other way. The problem is um, by doubling up or line breeding on some bulls, uh, it, can cause, it can cause issue that they won't be able to be used. But there's a bull we're using right now that's 24% inbred, but we'll use them on animals that aren't, um, that don't have any of his genes in their pedigree. So right away, the next generation is only eight to 13%. So it's, it's not just the bull himself, but it's what you use it on that contributes to the inbreeding. Does that help answer it for you? Yep. Yes. Thanks, Dan. That was awesome. Yeah. Yep. Another question here for you, Dan. Um, is the is does the computer system is there a computer system that does the matching that will look um, at what three traits are the lowest and and pick the the bull for you, or is that completely up to the uh, individual oh. farmer to do? Uh, yeah. So that's a good question. Um, there are mating programs uh, that. Um, companies like Seth, Sexing Technologies, or EastGen, or other, other companies, they can provide you mating programs that do it. Um, each company's mating program, of course, will be a little bit biased uh, to, their own, to their own bulls, but that, that's fine. Um, but uh, the good old fashioned way is looking at your animals and picking out the best matings and the best, um, we don't use a mating program at Blondin, and we never have. Uh, we look at each individual animal and pick the three traits that we want to improve. I still think uh, a computer can help you on a large scale, but when you're mating those special animals individually, I think you can make a, a much better educated decision using all the tools. Um, but I, we, we find that we still use our heads and our eyes to, to help make, a, make that decision. So. All right, great answer. 
So maybe I uh, see you've got some some fans of some of your bulls here. In yeah, the I see that. So that's great. Bonus um, points right there for Peyton and Ashley. Excellent. So maybe what we'll do is stop there and we'll turn it over to Seth, but get you to hang around and then we'll open the questions up to both you and Seth at the end. No problem. Hey, I'll be right here. Hear me? So Seth, we can hear you and um, you may have missed it, but we introduced you already. So right over to you. I did. I was on the phone actually when we first started and I'm home now and on the computer. So uh, um, just to follow up with that last question about the um, kind of the inbreeding and also the computer program for selecting bulls. Um, so we like we do use a mating program as well. Um, the way most mating programs work is you have to actually kind of do the legwork. You select the bulls that fit your breeding program, the traits that you desire to have. And usually the best method is that depending on the size of the herd to have, uh, you know, three to five, six bulls that you like. And then we will run those through a mating program to optimize um, the, the mating on the individual animals within the herd. And a big part of that is um, looking at inbreeding as well. So um, like our program quite often, um, the first thing it looks at is the percent inbreeding and whether it, the program will select that bull for the individual cow within the herd. Um, so there is no program to really select the bull for you. Um, you kind of have to go in with your list beforehand of the bulls that um, you think will fit your program and have the traits that you desire. And then the program will optimize those bulls within your breeding program. Um, I am going to share my screen here. Can everybody see that now? It just takes a second, okay. but uh, if you've hit share, it should come up in a second. Yeah, we can see it now. All right. So I, I probably will spend a little less time talking about specific traits. Um, if there certainly is any questions that people have about specific traits in the US side of things. We might have lost him. Um, to follow up on a, a couple things that Dan had talked about. Um, I guess kind of the starting point for me, um, can you guys still see my screen? So Seth, we can see that you're trying to share it, but we don't see anything on it yet. Okay. Uh, it's saying that your bandwidth is low. I'm wondering if that's the problem. Wi-Fi. That could be. If you want, Seth, if if you can do, if you can talk and um and do your presentation, and then you could email me your slides, and we can send them out to the kids after the fact if that helps. Yeah, or I'll just stop sharing. I don't know if somebody, uh, whether Jennifer wants. Uh, I was just simply on a bulls page on stgen.com, um, and it was gonna to look at some of the traits there. I don't know if somebody can share it. It probably is my internet connection. Yeah, what bowl do you want, Seth? I can pull it up quick. Um, so I just pulled up Stanton's Chief as a bowl to look at. It's probably a bowl some people may have heard of up there. Okay, give me a minute and I'll uh, grab it and I'll, I'll put it up here, hopefully. So I guess for me, what I'll start talking about with genomics is, um, you know, one of the things that we hear quite often about genomics or even talking about breeding cattle is you'll hear different kind of uh, terms thrown around there. Like um, the one that I hear quite often for people that maybe don't understand genomics completely or what, you know, or how we use genomics is, um, you know, how many people have heard the term, well, she's a, that's a genomic heifer, or that's a genomic bull, or that's a genomic cow. And I, I think the, the big thing to remember with genomics, 
um, is pretty much every trait that we looked at ever before genomics came out. We look at the same traits now, just as Dan had said, with a higher reliability. So before genomics came out, we completely relied on parent averages. So we would say, well, mom looks like this, or mom's um, genetic potential for milk production says it's this, dad's genetic pr uh, production or for milk is this, the average of those two things is this, and that's what we should expect the majority of their offspring to be. On average, it's gonna be 50% for mom and 50% from dad. Um, what genomics has done for us is it, again, I think the term that Dan used was it allows us to see, uh, to see things that we can't visually see ourselves. So it allows us to actually go to within the DNA and say, okay, what percent of this gene came from mom and which percent of it came from dad? And what we learned really quickly with genomics is that it's rarely ever 50-50 from mom and 50% from dad. Quite often, it could be 80% from dad and 20% from mom or vice versa. So what genomics allows us to do is see where did those genes actually come from for our end result in the animal we're looking at, whether it be a heifer or a bull or a cow within the herd already. Um, so where that is helpful is... Um, we talk, you know, because the way, the way I like to always look at it is how many people have ever seen that, that beautiful 93, 94 point cow standing in the barn who's never made a daughter for you that's nearly as good as mom. And so the term quite often used is, oh, she just, she doesn't transmit well. She's not a brood cow. Well, that, that ability to transmit is literally, literally what we're looking at with genomics, is, is that cow or that bull's ability to pass their genes on to the next generation. And some animals are, are very good at doing it, and some animals aren't as good at doing it. Just like vice versa, you could have the 81-point cow standing in the barn that ends up making an all-American or an all-Canadian offspring. Um, that Even though she did not um, exhibit those genes herself, she was able to pass those genes off. She carried them within her DNA and she was able to pass them on to her offspring or more of the genes came from dad in that mating and um, allowed that animal to become a better animal. Um, so for me, that's the big thing. And then again, back to the, the you know, the genomic animal, it's a genomic cow or a genomic bull. Uh, I think the big thing to remember is, um, you know, a lot of times we confuse that term genomics with indexes. So whether down here in the U.S. we're talking about TPI or net merit or up in Canada, you guys talk about your LPI index. Um, the numbers, those, those indexes certainly are derived from genomic information that we receive on an animal that does have genomics information. But that, that's different than being a genomic animal. That, that's just an index and one way to look at um, breeding cattle and mating cattle is using those indexes that compile a bunch of a whole bunch of traits together. Um, you know, there's people who breed. If you want to just solely look at, for us down in the United States, we look at rear leg side view. Um, so that is going to be the the set to the rear leg, whether they're posty or they're sickle legged. Um, so somebody that wants to specifically breed for um, legs that maybe aren't as posty. Um, we can look at that genomic marker or that gene to be able to select for that. You having any luck, Brianne? Yep, I got it. I just didn't want to uh, interrupt. So here, bear with me. Yep. And it should come up here shortly. If I'm doing this right. Do, 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 do. Come on. Oh. Is it working? Hang on. Oh, here we go. You guys see that yet? Is it working? It's not yeah. yet. It's, it's got the same black screen as Seth had. Huh. Interesting. I wonder why. Yeah, because it's showing here. Okay, hold on. Hmm. Sorry, it's up on my screen. Um, I don't know. 
me try something else. Keep going, so, Seth. That's all right. I can continue on. That's fine. So um, one way that we use genomics in, in my position with working with, with dairy men and women. Oh, there we go. Is it up? It yeah, we can up. see it now. Perfect. It is the American. Perfect. So this is um this is a bowl that um I just had pull up to look at some of the different numbers. Stanton's cheap. He's a pretty popular bowl down here in the U.S. I believe he's been pretty popular up in Canada as well here in the last year or so, a couple of years. Um, so you'll see it looks a little different. This is um this is a screenshot from our ST Genetics website, but it gives us all of the genomic information, all of the, the information on pedigree that you would get from Holstein USA. Um, it, with all their information on it. And um, if we scroll down a little bit, you can kind of see in the bottom, there is linear traits, just like uh, Dan was showing you with their heifer um, as well. And so when we start talking about these, these type traits or these linear traits, this is where we're really looking is down in this bottom square with all the bars to the left and the right, just, as, just like in the Canadian system. Um, uh, in above that, you'll see some numbers where it says PTAT type. That's that's our type number that we talk about. That's similar to your guys' confirmation number in Canada. Um, it's a much lower scale. So um, right currently in the breed, you know, if you can find an animal that is you know two and a two to two and a half um, PTAT or or above three even would be a really high um, type animal. Um, and then you can see to the right of that where it says UDC, that's utter composite. So that'd be another major um, type trait composite that we look at. Those are all your utter composites. So rear utter height, rear utter width, your T placement. Um, and then to the next, the one over there, you see FLC is your foot and leg composite. And that's a breakdown of foot and leg traits as well. Um, are you guys still okay to hear me? I see we see somebody's audio wasn't working. Yeah, I think you're fine. Uh, I think maybe Jared just has an issue. Perfect. Um, so when we, when we talk about type traits, those, those are where we're talking about. You can see all the breakdowns, strength, strength, stature, body depth, dairy form, rump angle, um, rear leg side view. Um, above that, we have some more of our, our health traits. We have sire cavities. I know that was one that was mentioned in the beginning about a trait that you can use genomics to help select for. Sire cavities is up here in the SCE. Um, and then at the very top, Brian, if you want to just scroll back up to the top a little bit, we have production and health traits. So at the very top, you'll see um, like milk, pound, and everything that we express is in pounds. So that's pounds of milk, pounds of fat, pounds of protein. Um, somatic cell score is the SCS. Below that, we have PL, which is productive life. So that is the ability for a cow to continue to stay productive in a herd. Um, and then we have DPR, which is daughter pregnancy rate, which would be similar to your guys' heifer fertility. Um, and then uh, heifer conception rate and cow conception rate. The big one for in the US these days that people are looking at is um, daughter pregnancy rate. You see we have a question from Braden. What is an ideal sire cavities? Um, so it's a, little, it's a little bit subjective from herd to herd. Um, a lot of the larger, um, I guess, quote unquote, commercial herds that I would work with down here in the US um, if we're breeding um, our heifer population, um, you know, a sire cavities in the six, you know, maybe a max of 7% is where a lot of pe people feel comfortable. Um, when you get into the more, uh, the larger cow population, more mature cows, um, that number can easily go up into that eight, nine. Um, for people that breed more for show type, they worry a little less about sire cavities. But the average dairy farm that I work with that's milking, say, a thousand cows, um, they want to be able to have calves that are born unassisted, have no problems, um, because there might not always be somebody right there at the moment to, to help them calve them out. And uh, there's a lot of research also that animals that calve with less issues are more productive, um, breed fact faster in their next lactation and so on. So it's a little bit subjective. I would say for the dairymen that I work with though, 
um, heifers, that six to seven percent mature cows, you know, under nine percent, you're usually pretty happy with it, with that. Um, so those are kind of the major breakdowns. So we talk about um, the like LPI, and down here in the U.S. we have TPI. You'll see in um, the the be like the third major box down. There's a breakdown for TPI, like this bull um, 2301. You know, he certainly is not a a super high TPI bull in the U.S. system, um, but he's he's a bull that um, kind of fits a lot of different breeding programs because he's making those really stylish type animals. Um, and he still adds a little bit of uh, production and type traits. Um, in the U.S. with our system, every, every uh, five years we have a genetic rollback. Uh, we call it a base change. So like his, this bull's numbers, you know, he's showing minus 349 pounds of milk, which doesn't look great, but we just had a base change in April where we kind of reset the, the average. Um, and because the Holstein breed has made so many strides genetically, um, we had a, a big base change. So every, like every animal lost 500 pounds of milk. Um, so, you know, pre base change in April proofs, you know, uh, chief was a positive milk bull. Um, so those, you know, those are kind of the, when you're looking at the traits, those are the, the main breakdowns um, that we look at. It's um, when we start talking about individual um, breedings for different herds and what people are looking at, it's, it's again, it's very subjective. Um, with my, well, part of my job is I do a lot of uh, bull sorts. We'll sit down, I talk with a dairyman, we figure out um, what kind of traits are important to them. Um, you know, it's kind of constantly changing and in the US market these days, there's a lot less emphasis on pounds of milk and fluid milk because we're paid kind of similar to you guys in Canada, components are worth a lot more. So um, we, can, we get paid more for the pounds of fat and the pounds of protein that we ship. So um, a lot of farms that we work with now, we, we're looking at pounds of fat, pounds of protein, or a term you might hear thrown around a lot these days is CFP, which is combined fat and protein. Um, and then uh, traits like DPR, again, uh, very similar to you guys is heifer fertility. That's the ability for an animal to become pregnant, um, the ease of that animal to become pregnant. So we want animals that um, calve in, are productive, but then are able to breed back and, be, and um, calve back in in the next year to be, you know, continue to be productive within the herd. Um, and so, you know, I, and again, on the type side of things, a big focus on people in, in my area, specifically in New England, has been um, less on like foot and leg composite, but more on that rear leg side view. Um, we've noticed within the breed that we've become very posty legged. We have a lot of cows that are straight legged, and those straight legged cows tend not to um, stand up as well, especially in a freestall setting where they're walking around a lot. We like them to have a little more flex to their hawk and a little more flex to their legs to be able to walk around the facilities with ease and, and uh, be able to stay in, in, the, in the facility for a long time. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the quick and dirty with a, a US proof. Again, I, I don't want to muddy the waters on all these different numbers and terms, but um, the, the main thing is there's a lot of similarities in, in the proofs between the US and Canada. And it really, at the end of the day, it comes down to every breeder and what they, um, the traits that they desire to have within the herds, the traits that they feel are gonna be the most profitable and be the best um, to continue their herd on into the future. And then somebody like my job is to help them um, pick those traits. And, and really the, the genomics of that, again, is just allowing us to um, go within the actual DNA of the animal and see what their, what those genes are within the DNA and what their ability to pass those on to their offspring. Um, so on the female side of things with genomic testing, um, we, our company, we do have our own genomic lab. We do, um, we, we are very heavily involved with genomic testing on the female population as well. Um, I know last week your conversation uh, revolved a lot around beef on dairy and using those bottom end animals um, for, to, to breed with beef semen. 
and that's really where genomics um, comes in on, on the farm side of things more, probably even more importantly than the male side, is um, allowing us to make better decisions on the animals that we're going to utilize to progress our, our genetics along. Which animals do we want to raise heifer calves out of? And uh, so for a lot of my dairymen and a lot of the dairymen in the US that we work with, um, that being able to genomic sample the female population helps them to make better decisions on what, not only maybe what animals to keep on the farm and, and spend the time and money raising, but down the road when it's time to breed that heifer population, what animals are the best animals to breed um, to make the next generation for the farm. And um, so that's kind of where it kind of circles back around with your beef on dairy talk last week. And um, for, for us and, and our model at ST Genetics, um, we talk about, a lot about sex semen and beef semen. And this kind of where um, genomics on the female population comes in is, is uh, being able to decide what, what animals in your herd are going to get sex semen and what animals are going to get beef semen. And the amazing thing that you see quite often is the variation between parent average and the genomic numbers. So if you have a heifer that's born, born on the farm and let's say um, their genomic net merit is that, or their parent average net merit, let's say is uh, 400 um, and the average for your herd is 400. Um, quite often we see animals that when we go from a parent average of 400 and we genomic test them, they could either go up or down 100 points one way or the other. So if um, 400 is your average and you know you only need to breed the top 40% of your herd, um, that animal that was maybe 300 net merit, if we only had parent average, we might have bred to beef semen, but we genomic test her, we find out that um, she, her, within her DNA, ge genomically, she is a better animal than what her parent average tells us. That animal easily could move into the top uh, portion of your population to now get bred with sex semen. So as we get more and more strategic and, and dial in breeding programs with people and they're using more heavily on sex semen or beef semen or, or using embryos on the bottom end of their herd instead of beef semen, it allows us to be a lot more accurate. The other thing that we also see a lot, um, I shouldn't say a lot, but it's fairly prevalent in uh, the herds that we work with is mis-ID rates. So the genomic testing in the female population, again, becomes important if all of a sudden you have a calf that you believe is a, you know, a Stanton's chief out of cow so-and-so, and then you get a genomic result back and says, ah, that isn't a Stanton's chief actually. Uh, maybe the breeder had three different breeding guns with him that day and he accidentally bred the wrong cow to the wrong gun and it's actually a, <clears throat> a cleanup bowl that we use. And now that instead of that being a calf that we keep and raise on the farm or maybe breed sex semen to, that now becomes an animal that maybe leaves the farm and we don't raise or an animal that gets bred with beef semen or gets an embryo put into them. Um, see, we got a couple questions. How often should we be using sex semen? So that's very farm dependent. Um, what we, the approach that we kind of take with at ST Genetics is we work with the individual farms. We have some really neat tools that we use on those farms to evaluate their overall reproductive efficiency, um, we look a lot at their cull rates, like how, how fast are cows moving through the herd um, to help determine the number of replacements you actually need to raise. Um, and then we can determine based off from your reproductive performance um, but on sex semen, your reproductive uh, performance with conventional semen and beef semen, the appropriate um, places and the number of breedings you need to use with sex and beef and conventional semen. Um, so it's very farm dependent. Um, you'll have some herds that based, you know, if they have a really high cull rate, cows are leaving the herd a lot, they may have to use a little more sex semen than a herd that cows stay around for a long time. They have a lot of old cows in the barn that are milking and we just don't need to use as many, uh, make as many replacements. They won't have to use as much sex semen. So it's very farm dependent. The, you know, one thing that we see a lot in um, the herds that we work with and the big movement in the US 
um, as dairies are always trying to become more efficient, um, is by using sex semen, we actually are able to reduce the replacement population. So a farm, let's say um, a, a thousand cow dairy needs to raise um, 50 heifers a month. Well, in the past, um, when they were breeding everything to conventional semen, they might have had 100 calves born in a month. And now either you pick and choose at, you know, the at day old or a week old, whether you're going to keep that heifer, which ones you're going to keep, which ones you're going to get rid of, um, or you keep them all and all of a sudden you have way more heifers than you need. We raise those heifers, which cost a lot of money, and then um, they calve in. And so what happens is a lot of dairymen say, well, we spent all of this money to raise this heifer. So we're going to milk her now to try to recoup our, our investment in the raising costs. And so we get rid of an older cow, maybe a cow that's um, third or fourth lactation. And uh, we get rid of that cow to replace her with a young one that we have just spent all this money on. Well, those old cows that are in the herd, they've already paid for themselves. They're more productive. They ship more pounds of milk generally, more pounds of fat and protein a day than a, than a first lactation heifer. And they're more profitable cow for us because they have already paid for themselves. They're, they're covering their, their feed costs and some of those, those uh, fixed costs that are there um, with raising an animal or keeping animals on the farm. But they're a much more um, efficient cow and they're a much more productive cow and a much more profitable cow. So what we've seen down here in the U.S. is people actually shifting in the past 10, 15 years is we were milking large populations of first lactation animals and less mature cows. But by using sex semen and strategy with genomic testing, sex semen, and then um, whether it be beef semen or the use of embryos, is that we actually can reduce the number of heifers that we're raising on the farm while selecting the best heifers or the best cows to make heifers out of. And I think that kind of plays into how has sex semen affected the industry, fresh cow market. Um, so certainly it has affected and um, sex semen is a tool. It's a tool that's been around for several years now and it's, it's been perfected over the years. It's become better. And like a lot of tools in the industry, um, people maybe used it in different ways. And there's people that went crazy using sex semen and produced lots of heifers. They bred everything they had to sex semen and they produced lots of heifers which sure did drive down um, replacement costs because people weren't needing to buy replacements as much. Um, like I just talked about, a lot of the progressive dairymen that we're working with now realize that they don't need to produce that many heifers and actually having more heifers than they need on the farm is not only a financial liability for them, but it's also, it overcrowds their farms, it overcrowds their barns and it doesn't allow the animals that they are gonna keep to, um, become the best animals to, that they can on the farm. So I, there is definitely been a major shift of using sex semen to actually produce less heifers, but better heifers. Um, so that's kind of where I see. There's certainly, you know, I, I don't know necessarily in Canada, but down here in the US, there, there isn't a lot of people um, using more sex semen than they need to to make more heifers. The, the, the switch is definitely to make less heifers on, on the farm. And um, I think we will see um, in the future that, that it will come back, that the farms that aren't using this technology and are not using utilizing technologies we have to produce the right number of heifers they need for their farm may you still need to buy replacements and there won't be as many replacements to buy because a lot of the farms are only making the number they need to for their own individual farm. Um, I don't know if that, if that answers that or not, but um, if there's any other questions, that, that's kind of um, my, my spiel on genomics and kind of looking at a, a genomic proof, a bull proof in the US. Um, if there certainly is any other questions, feel free to, to let me know. Yeah, so we can open it back up now for questions for Seth or Dan. If uh, anyone has one, they can uh, either raise their hand or unmute themselves and just ask the question or type it in the chat box. Um, I got a question. 
Yeah, go ahead, Christian. Uh, like I see a lot of like young, young calves selling for thousands of dollars. How does one make their money back on that? Like a hydronomic heifer. You want that set or you want me? Well, sure. So from, I mean, I'm certainly not in the purchasing and marketing side of the business, but um, you see these young calves that are being bought uh, for large amounts of money uh, based off from genomic um, um, predictions that come in, genomic samples that come in. And really where the money for, for that comes from is um, people selling the offspring, being able to flush or IVF and other, either sell sons or daughters of that animal if they're of that high, high quality, you know, high enough caliber to get animals into, into stud. Um, Dan, if you got anything to add that from your guys' standpoint, you guys are certainly in the business of buying animals. Yeah, so um, for us on the genomic side, genomics allow us to make better investments. So whereas before we could spend money on a young heifer because she looked good, um, now we can have, there can be four full sisters and like I said before, we, we, we've seen it on our farm where one carries exactly the gene, genes we're looking for and uh, we'll spend all the money to go buy her compared to spending uh, an average price to buy one of them. We'll specifically spend more money to get the one that has those genes that we look for. So, so what happened when genomics came around it allowed people to buy animals that they knew carried the genes they were looking for. And when that happens, you get more reliability. And when you get more reliability, you get more money being invested into it because the people have more trust in the system that that's the animal that's going to be able to produce the offspring um, to pay back that money. So when, when you see those big money heifers um, selling for a lot of money, uh, the way to get that money back is by investing or by uh, producing a bull or another high female from them. So you'll see a lot of them get IVF'd or flushed and uh, to try and produce the next generation. That's the only way on those high genomic animals to, to get that money back on them. And we're actually going to be discussing that in one of our future meetings. Um, we're going to be talking with Adam, Dr. Adam Haight about um, IVF embryos, the actual production of them. And then we have someone um, going to talk to us about how they got started marketing um, embryos and um, genomic testing bulls and such for, for AI units and things. So that is something we are going a few more questions here in the chat box so um for seth and dan what is oh so we'll, we'll hold on the sire ones uh do you sell more semen from young genomic bulls or proven sires well i can only speak mostly for myself but i think i can pretty well say for our company as a whole, it definitely is um, young genomic bulls. Um, people are always constantly trying to push the genetic edge and uh, your, your highest numbers, whether it be a composite number, an index number, or an individual trait is always going to be your youngest animals. Um, so for a lot of the herds that we work with, they're always trying to push the genetic envelope and they want the the, um, the biggest bang for their buck. And so your highest numbers are generally going to come from the young animal, the younger bulls. Um, so for our company, uh, um, I certainly don't have all of the numbers to, to say it for sure, but I feel pretty confident saying we, we sell a lot more um, younger genomic bulls than we do proven bulls. Um, we, we do sell a lot of proven bulls, uh, bulls like Chief and, St and Delta Lambda, um, Delta himself, Rubicon are all proven bulls and that are still uh, sellers for us. Um, but definitely for me personally in my area, definitely sell a lot more younger genomic bulls. Yeah, and in Canada, the average right now is it's 
it's between 70 and 75 percent young genomic bulls. So we went from an industry that used almost 100 uh, percent proven bulls uh, 15 to 20 years ago to now where we uh, people want to get ahead and genomics has been proving that it's been going well and uh, with that the industry has shifted to uh, to use 70 75 percent at blondin at the farm in our breeding program we're looking for more at 95 percent um 95 percent use of young genomic sires so in our breeding program excellent great question other questions for our panel before we let them get into some of their favorites All right, I don't see any. So, um, Dan, why don't we start with you? You, I think you saw a few of the questions that had come in there about uh, some of your favorites and uh, which bulls you're currently using and uh, anything like that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, sure. Um, so at Blondin, we flush. Um, so those that aren't aware, flushing is collecting embryos from the cows and implanting them in recipients. So we flush every Thursday at Blondin uh, between three and five animals. And so we're, we're always using new bulls and always looking for bulls to use in our system. So to give you an idea, some of the bulls we are using, um, we're using our own bulls, uh, like Moment, who's the number one confirmation bull in the world. Um, so we're using some of him. He's extremely high type bull. And then we're going, I just wrote some down here before we started. Um, we're using another bull. Uh, his name is Ali Oop. Uh, that's from Brabantdale. And it's a CMEX bull. So we're using him. He's a high production bull, but also some good type. Uh, we're using a new bull from our program. His name is Legend. His mother is the number one type cow in Canada and he's tied as number two. And um, from Seth's, we're actually using uh, some Chief. We're going back and using a little bit of him more as a bull to sell some embryos from. Um, uh, then after that, uh, we're looking, we're on a proven bull side, we have been looking at well, Chief, Chief is a proven bull, and we still use actually a little bit of Goldwyn. We have some Goldwyn semen at home, so we still use a little bit of him here and there to make some. So Moment, Alligator is another one that we've been using. Legend, alley uh, Chief, Boom, and uh, we will start, we have started to use a new bull that we have coming out soon. His name is Destiny. So he'll be a new one to watch for a little later on this summer, but we have some early, early doses that we're just starting to use. So that gives you an idea of some of the bulls that we're using. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. And uh, Seth, over to you. So for, um, for me, it's going to sound a little bit uh, playing for the home team right now, but uh, one of my favorite bulls that uh, uh, we have calves on the ground and then still using him is, is Stanton's Chief. Um, we have, like I said, we have several calves on the ground out of them. They're very consistent. Um, he's been a, a nice complementary mix with some improved health traits, um, some prior to our base change, better uh, production traits as well. Um, bulls that I'm currently using. Um, Delta Lambda, again, he's an SD bull. He's a, a bull that we're using some. And um, Altitude Red is for a red bull of ours. Um, other bulls, that's kind of, you know, personally, I don't own a lot of animals. We, we have around 20 head. So I don't use um, a lot of different bulls at a time. So that's kind of the, the ones that I'm using right now. But kind of prior to those ones before Chief, um, used a lot of Diamondback. Um, Meridian was a bull that we used a little bit as well. Um, so definitely in the last uh, few generations I've tried to kind of balance out a little bit and, and add a little more health and stuff um, to the
All right. Um, just a question here for you both or, or anybody who wants to answer. Um, applicable to all breeds or is it is genomics used for specific breeds? That's a good question, Jen. Um, so genomics is, is it, it is by breed. So per breed, they're compared to their other uh, constituents, but constituents, but um, uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily um, just for one breed. So for example, we actually just bought our first uh, Jersey Bull and um, he's tested, I can see, uh, uh, I can see Besley dancing over there. Anyway, um, so we bought our first Jersey Bull. He's number one confirmation bull in Canada. And we, it doesn't matter the breed. Um, the only thing with the breeds though, is the, the breeds with a smaller population, they won't, their genomics won't be as accurate because they have a smaller population base. The good thing, Holsteins and Jerseys, they have a big, big population that they've been able to build up the data, but it's the breeds like um, maybe milking shorthorn or brown Swiss that maybe don't have as much population. So they have genomics, but they won't be quite as reliable as maybe the Holsteins or the Jerseys would be. So. And Seth, for you in the US, is the, the Ayrshires, brown Swiss, Guernseys, are they all using genomics as well? So yeah, it's just it's the same down here. Um, you can genomic test any of uh, any of the breeds, as Dan mentioned. Certainly, uh, it's most prolific in the Holsteins and Jerseys. It's the largest uh, percent of the population of cattle, um, so it's used a lot more heavily. Um, certainly, on the male side of things, um, it's used through all breeds. But on the female side, which is really where we gather a lot more information. Um, there's a lot more female Holsteins and female Jerseys being genomic tested just based off from the number of animals within the U.S. herd. Um, so yeah, you're getting a lot higher reliabilities within those breeds than, than you do the other ones. We do actually have the ability to test crossbreeds as well through our company, um, but they are, they are um, compared to a Holstein baseline. So if you have a Holstein Jersey cross and you genomic test it, it's going to be compared to against the Holstein. So the chances of them, they're probably never going to be at the top of the list, but at least um, if you're looking to uh, continue to crossbreed, it gives you numbers to look at to, to use towards your, your program. All right. And Dan, I see a question in here for you about uh, Blunden. Are you still doing much exporting of eggs or are you more so keeping your flushes back to produce more of your own sires? That's a good question. So the last few years, so when I started at Blondin eight years ago, um, that's what they brought me in to do was do a lot of embryo export and we sold, we sold a lot of embryos, uh, six to 800 embryos, 600 to 800 embryos a year. Um, but the last few years have been very tough on international markets. We've been very lucky in Canada. We have a quota system that has per, uh, protected and helped us keep our milk price stable. Um, but other countries around the world, the US, Australia, Western Europe, that don't have that system, um, a lot of breeders uh, were affected by that, uh, where the milk price dropped considerably. So embryos are connected to milk price. When milk price goes down, uh, farmers have less money to buy genetics. So the last few years um, we shifted, we, we still are selling and exporting embryos. Uh, we just sold some here yesterday and uh, today, but we have shifted a lot to now implanting a lot of our embryos to make sure that we try and produce the next generations of bulls from from cows like Legendary, who's the number one confirmation cow, trying to get the next generation of bulls and heifers um, for our program. So we implant quite a bit now, uh, but we still do sell a few here and there. Um, that's always gonna be part of our market. So. But it is down, it is down considerably um, in the last one year about, uh, uh, for embryos to be exported or for sale, and that has slowed down. The only market that still cons uh, stays consistent is selling uh, 
sex semen embryos to Japan, that, uh, that market has been still uh, fairly stable and consistent. But the rest of the world, uh, the world, the rest of the world is trying to play catch up as milk prices start to come back up. So, good question. And just a follow up question there for you, Dan. How many recips are you calving in each month? Uh, so we have um, we calve about six hundred. We milk about two hundred head, and we calve about six hundred per year. So um, it's. It depends on the months because, of course, we'll try to calve more in at certain times for show calves and things like that. But overall, we calve about 600 animals per year at Blondin. So. Excellent. Good questions. Yeah. Uh, another question here for you both or, or either one can answer. Uh, is there one is there one oversight organization or does each company sort of own the um, the information for the animals that they test? You can start that, Seth, if you want. Yeah, so so down here in the US, it's uh, there is one organization that collects all of the data and uh, puts it together for our for our proofs and that is uh we, we call it the cdcb which is the council on dairy cattle breeding um it used to be the usda the u.s department of agriculture that ran it and then several years ago they created the cdcb which is um, now a panel um it, it consists of uh, people from the usda researchers um people industry people as well so all of the major um, breed um, associations um, have people that sit on that board. So Holstein USA um, has, you know, the CEO of Holstein USA sits on the CDC board along with Jersey. Um, and then there's also people from within the AI industry um, that also sit on that panel as well that make the decisions on, um, on chain, proof changes, if we're going to adjust formulas and, and, and things like that. But all that information, uh, whether it be DHIA testing for milk, um, genomic testing is all fed into the CDCB and then they spit out our, our, gen our um, genetic information back to us. Yeah, and here in Canada, we're, at, we're very lucky. We have CDN, uh, Canadian Dairy Network, which is now Lactinet. They are the ones, um, and you, you saw in my presentation, those, those pages that display the genetic results. Um, we're lucky we have one central resource that does all the breeds and everything all together. So that's accessible by anyone around the world. And uh, yeah, CDN keeps track of all that information. You did touch on a point, Jennifer. It's a very interesting and sometimes controversial topic about who owns the data. Um, that one is still up in the air. Um, if you ask me, as a breeder, the breeders own that information, it's theirs. Um, but that's a bigger fish to fry um, on another call. Excellent. I don't think the question was trying to get that deep into it, more so okay. whether there was a central <laughs> repository, but I'll be interested for that conversation sometime, Dan. Yes. Last chance for questions for Seth or Dan before we start to wrap up. All right, I don't see any more, so I think we're good. I'm going to turn it over to Courtney, who has some words for, uh, as, just as I said that. Um, last question here, and then we'll turn it over to Courtney. So do you have any promising gen genomic animals out of Chief Moonlight? Yeah, so Jack's asking about Chief Moonlight, who is a cow that we purchased a um, uh, few months ago now. So we only got her, uh, I think it was maybe February, January maybe? Anyway, so we don't have any progeny from her just yet, but we do have some, uh, some pregnancies coming. So uh, Chief Moonlight is a, obviously a chief. She went 87 as a two-year-old and... Uh, at our place and uh, we've been flushing. Her genomics show though that she is very high for milk production and type, which is um, sometimes harder to get that balance. 
So it's allowed, uh, uh, so we're working with her. We're trying to, we're flushing her every so often and trying to make as many pregnancies as we can. Awesome. We'll have to have you back next year, Dan, to hear, yeah. hear the outcomes. Yeah. Um, so Courtney, over to you for some words for our speakers. All right, so Dan and Seth, I want to thank you on behalf of the Ontario Vet and Dairy Science Club for teaching us all about genomics on both the Canadian and American side, and we'll be sure to use this information on our future breeding decisions. No problem, you're welcome, and uh, drop me a note anytime. If you have any questions, just drop me a note on Facebook. Uh, I usually try to get back to everyone as quick as I can, so I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you guys having me on, and. I think uh, just my, as my parting words, don't fall into the trap of, of trying to pigeonhole genomic versus type or, or a genomic animal is keep the open mind that genomics applies to, to every, whatever you're trying to choose for. Use those genomics to your advantage for whatever your breeding solution is. Yep. Excellent. Super interesting talk from both of you. So thank you very much. We can let you guys both go and just for our 4-H members, just a reminder that our next, next meeting is next Tuesday, June the 23rd uh, at 7.30. We'll be back at the same place and same time. Um, and I can't remember who our speaker is for next week, but we will update you by email um, as we get closer to next Tuesday. Have a super week, everybody, and we'll talk to everyone again soon. Bye. Bye, thank you.